historic metals, our resources are being depleted at an unsustainable rate. The best description I heard as a measure is that if, as the world increases in development to standard of living in, say, Europe, we would need four Earth equivalents to meet those resource needs. One thing I'm sure of is we're not going to get three more Earths. So we'll need to utilize our resources in a, in a different way. Some of these approaches that are being uh, at the heart of green chemistry investigations is utilizations of renewable sources such as biomass in order to, uh, uh, to supplant the depleting resources we use currently. The use of nanoscience and nanotechnology to have a dematerialization so you get the exact same performance or perhaps increased performance with orders of magnitude less material. Now this is another important point where we need to do the right things right. It is certainly possible to pursue a technological future relying on nanotechnology without paying attention to the impacts on human health and the environment. It will be essential that green nanotechnology, which we will hear some more about will, uh, in, in this conference, will, will be essential. Uh, carrying out transformations with light rather than uh, chemicals, carbon dioxide, chitin, and waste utilization are also going to be important. I give one example of uh, the use of polylactic acid, uh, a corn-based uh, material for our feed uh, for, for plastics. This is currently being made from corn, but the transformation that needs to happen is that it will uh, shift over to agricultural wastes in the, in the future. Food supply. Because of the, the green agricultural revolution in the 60s and 70s, we are currently able to produce enough food to feed the population of the world. Now, with, with policies and politics and, and, uh, and regional conflicts, there, are, there, there still exists hunger and starvation in the world, but the, the efficiency with which we produce our food is nothing short of a technological miracle. This is just one chart showing the increase in grain um, production over the last few decades. So it's a reasonable question to ask how did we achieve this? Well, in part, it was through the increased use of, of pesticides, the increased use of fertilizers. I come back to asking about doing the right things right and doing the right things wrong. Everyone wants to achieve increased efficiency in food production. We do not want to do it in a way that creates uh, contaminated drinking water, persistent bioaccumulative substances which can be damaging to our reproductive health as well as to the ecosystems. Currently there's a called a dead zone at the end of the Mississippi River in the United States and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there are about 150 of these dead zones around the world. Part of the contribution is, to some of, is from some of these pesticides and fertilizers. So, green chemistry is actively looking at how do you achieve the performance that you, that you need, getting pesticides, that target specific biological functions in the pest, unique to the pest, such that it's not going to uh, affect other beneficial insect species or humans and other, other species. How do we make sure that these don't persist? Well, one thing that uh, chemists are very good at is, is controlling fundamental properties through molecular design and designing them to degrade after the useful life is over. Fertilizers and fertilizer adjuvants, rather than putting 10 times the amount of fertilizer that you need and having this get into either the groundwater or getting into uh, the, the atmosphere that you put on the, the amount that it's 
is required and have it drawn to the um, drawn to the plant and of course the important use of nitrogen fixing plants and the use of the agricultural waste for beneficial uh, and profitable uses is important. I give this one example of uh, the, a winner of the U.S. Presidential Green Chemistry Award and this is a new biofungicide and I could go on about its environmental benefits of how it's it's made from biological materials through a biosynthesis. It's, it's biodegradable, uh, dramatically less toxic. But what I want to point out is that the use of this particular pesticide allows workers to go back into the field much quicker, I think, uh, after just a few hours than any other competing pesticides. That, that benefit translates directly into tremendous economic, um, uh, economic benefit. Again, coupling the, the innovation, the profitability with the environmental benefit is going to be essential. Finally, I'd just like to mention toxics in the environment. Uh, this is one thing that is, uh, is going to be essential. Substances both bioaccumulating in our bodies and in the, the biosphere. One of green chemistry's greatest strengths is the ability to design for reduced hazard. Uh, something that I'll be discussing uh, at length tomorrow, so I won't go into it very much today, is how we approach this question of molecular design. One example that I would like to give is about uh, the work of uh, a chemist out of a university, Carnegie Mellon in the United States, who is working on a new type of catalyst that will carry out oxidations. Oxidations, of course, being one of our most fundamental uh, transformations. And how to move away from uh, chlorine chemistry for carrying out industrial oxidations to something that can activate hydrogen peroxide. Of course, the, the waste product of uh, hydrogen peroxide oxidation being water. While doing this fundamental work, working at the, at the molecular level, this catalyst is able to affect everything from textile bleaching, pulp and paper, water cleaning, laundry, petroleum refining, and even some of our homeland security issues because of uh, its ability to kill anthrax spores. My point is that by working at the most fundamental level, you're able to address such a broad range not only of industries, but of the, of the sustainable, sustainability challenges that we often feel are of a magnitude and complexity that is almost paralytic. We look at these challenges as though they're things that we can't, that we can't begin to address. And yet it's by looking at the fundamentals, looking at the intrinsic nature of our materials and our transformations and our production methods that we can have this type of broad impact. So I will just briefly conclude by saying I do think it is essential to have sustainability and innovation inextricably linked. If we look at the example of, of music, it wasn't so long ago that we were all listening to records, moved on to tapes of various types, and then introduced CDs and onto all of the different incarnations of MP3 players, including the iPod Nano, the video iPod, etc., etc. Why do I mention this? I mention this because so many times the way that we deal with our issues of chemicals in the environment is often by, by passing certain types of regulations that say, you are listening to a vinyl record and you need to start listening to a, to a tape. And it gets frozen in time. We do this at times when we never could imagine things like the, the iPod or the video iPod. And what we need to unleash is the power of innovation in order to get off this unsustainable trajectory we're on in a way that blends environmental and economic improvement.
I just want to conclude by saying I may be the most optimistic person in the room because I do believe that every time science and technology has been uh, asked to engage on, on big issues, it has, it has stepped up. I do know that, uh, that whether we're looking at the transformations in, in medicine that uh, have allowed in the, the past century the average lifespan in the United States to go from 47 years to 72 years or more, that when we're looking at whether it's transportation or computing, that I'll look at uh, the fact that all of the computing power that sent a man to the moon is now found in my phone. Do I think science and technology is up to the challenge? Yes, I do. Do I believe that we need to engage this capability with, with an urgency that is up to us? So that is the open question. Will we engage science and technology with the, with the urgency that's required to meet our sustainability challenges? I conclude as a strategic optimist that we will because we can and we will because we must.